My name is Carlton Cartwright, and I'm the Executive Director for Veterans Memorial and Multicultural History Incorporated. And today is July 25th, Wednesday. What year is it? Uh, 2020. There you go. And I've got my students. Ariana Kenya. And Chester Gardner. Okay. And we are at, what is the name of this place? Make Your Mark Community Co-working Space. All right. And we also have Kimberly Klein on hand. Okay. And we're in the city of Deland, the state of Florida, on a bright and sunshiny day. Sir, what is your name? My name is Raymond E. Struther. Okay. He is Earl, Raymond Earl Struther. Okay. And what branch of the service were you in? I served in the Army. What year? I entered the Army Reserve in the year of two, uh, 1977, August 1977. I retired October uh, 2007. A combination of Army Reserve and active duty time. Okay. How many years total? Total of 30 years. Okay. All right. Um, um, where, where were you born? I was born in Lexington, South Carolina. Okay. Um, what were you doing before you went to service? Before I went to service, uh, of course, I grew up in Lexington, South Carolina, my home. Uh -huh. um, I worked after the graduation from high school for about four years, mm -hmm. and I was able to uh, attend college, South Carolina State University. Uh, but prior to that, I was working before uh, going into a service. After attending South Carolina State University, I earned a degree in mechanical engineering. While I studied mechanical engineering, I joined the ROTC department. And at the same time, I was serving in the United States Army Reserve as a uh, combat medic. Okay. Well, did you have your degree prior to going into the service? Uh, yes, I've, I've completed the ROTC program okay. and I completed my degree at the same time. So you went in, did you go in as, a, as an officer? I went in as an officer upon completing my degree. My right. first enlistment, though, I, w I was enlisted initially as a combat medic, I was enlisted. And then upon completing my degree, I received my ROTC commission also at the same time from South Carolina State University in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Okay. Um, we're, uh, we're, um, where was basic training? Basic training when I was enlisted was Fort Jackson, South Carolina, C41, Charlie Company, uh, C41 on Tank Hill, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Okay. And uh, upon completing basic training, I. Uh, How many weeks was basic training? Basic training at that time, I want to think, was uh, six weeks, six weeks basic training. Okay. And then from there, I uh, went to Fort Sam Houston, and that's where I studied the uh, combat medic and did the medic training at uh, Fort Sam. Tell us about your training instructors, your TIs. The, uh, I remember the one uh, in particular, uh, my, my drill instructor was cool. They was beautiful, I would say. I learned a lot from them. Uh, I uh, also have to give credit to my father, who's a World War II veteran. Uh -huh. uh, my father uh, was part of Buffalo Soldiers. So I got to give credit to them because of the discipline, which I think they instilled in me. My drill sergeant, I can remember drill sergeant Cortez. Drill Sergeant Cortez was a very, very professional dynamite. He took good care of us, made sure we learned. He, wa he wanted to show us what success in the Army looked like, and I think he did that. Um, my drill instructors, like I say, uh, was, was, was dynamic, particularly Drill Sergeant Cortez. I have to give appreciation for that. Um, they taught us the basic skills on how to take care of ourselves, uh, how to take care of your, your battle buddy. All of these was important for the drill sergeant, he conveyed those things to us. Um, you hear horror stories about drill sergeant? I, I can tell you, yes, they're in your face, but they meant well. They wanted you to build you success, to, and I'm gonna put the term, to build a man, to be a soldier, to be a woman, be a soldier, and that's what it was all about. Yeah, they was firm, they was fair, and that's what I appreciate about my drill sergeants. Even people use the term like dogging you out type thing. Uh -huh. I, 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 was, I was not to say, a model soldier, but I was I was I was a really good troop, and my drill sergeant appreciated that, and I appreciated them. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't what they would consider a knucklehead trying to do things that uh, was against the rules of policy. So that being said, uh, 
I necessarily wasn't a favorite, but I was one of the sharper ones and did not mind completing my task. Okay, I'm gonna segue for a minute. Usually I ask this question to, towards the end of the interview, but uh, curious. Well, it's, um, it's, uh, it, I, it, I'm, you know, what, how old are you? 22. You, you, I'm, apparently you would strongly encourage young people to, um, to join the military. Oh, without a doubt. I, I would say to a young person today, and I, I advocate the military, you know, the discipline is there, but I will tell you the people that you meet. And, and, I, and I, let me say this, as for young people, if anyone wants to see this. Um, like I mentioned about Drill Sergeant Cortez, even when I was in South Carolina State, I had, uh, at the time, Captain Turner, he General Turner now, two-star general. These are the people that you meet along the way that encourage you, that it's more into you than you realize because they see something in you. And if you follow what they're trying to encourage to you uh, and try to advise you on, uh, you have a very successful military career. I, I would tell you that. And these are some of the things that I took to heart that when I was speaking to the, uh, say, senior military and the most experienced military uh, uh, people I met, whether it was a uh, non-commissioned officer, mm -hmm. whether it was an officer. I took the advice. So I would say to a young person today, if you get a chance to talk to someone in the military or visit with a military installation, talk to the local recruiter, you will find yourself meeting people, getting education. That's another thing, the schools. I went to many military schools. I, I, I can't begin to tell you I was able to accomplish uh, my master's degree at the expense of the military. I was able to get a level three certify, certification as a contracting officer, and I was one of 85 to receive such uh, uh, certification of, on the, my, my exit in 2007 uh, which, when I retired. There were 85 of us had such certification that was on I could do at the time. So I would say to a young person that if you really interested in the military, even if you not, don't know much about it, learn about it. And if you hear war stories that people are telling you, their bad experiences and all, sometimes you have to find out what they had to contribute to create that bad experience. But I would highly encourage young people to get involved with someone with military experience mm -hmm. and to talk to military recruiters and see what the opportunities are there. If you got a job to do, do your job. But no one will stop you from learning, educated, and the military offers it what I will consider that upper mobility and give you what you need to say, take yourself to the next level, to the next step of your professionalism, your growth, your education, respect, dignity, and all of that comes into it. And have values that carry you for the rest of your life. And I would say that to a young person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, tech school, you, medical? Medical. I, Where? I went, that was Fort Sam, Fort Sam Houston. Medical. What's that? Uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Okay. At the time. That's how long? How long was your your tech school? Uh, that was I want to say like eight, eight weeks. weeks, eight eight to nine weeks. I think it was a twelve week. No, it wasn't. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. That was a sixteen weeks program. Okay. Sixteen weeks program. It was four months. Four okay. months. Yeah, uh -huh. sixteen weeks program. Um, there, uh, of course, you learn the basic life of uh, combat uh, survival in terms of applying uh, combat uh, medical skills on, 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 on the battlefield. And that's what it's all about. That's why it's classified combat medic. Um, of course, you, you learn how to, uh, uh, you know, stop bleeding, uh, how to treat wounds, bullet wounds in particular. You learn how to evacuate, uh, say, casualties from the battlefield, things of that nature. Uh, and one thing, you know, come to mind to me is the fact that at that time you had what we call an old green field jacket. How do you take the field jacket and make it into a stretcher? And you had to use some of the equipment because some things on the battlefield you may not have the convenience of an ambulance and so forth. But you had to find out even how you carry your buddy off the, off the battlefield and things of that nature. So um, with that, of course, you know, everyone learned how to call medevac and things like that. Medevac was the uh, helicopter that, that you had to call in for uh, uh, evac evacuation. With that being said, and being in that 
area of the uh, medical field. Mm -hmm. That was my heart, that's where I was set to go. Um, I was with a hospital unit at the time. I had applied for, got accepted to be in a PA program, LPN PA program, what I was going for. And uh, at that time, it, many changes was going on in the country. The Vietnam War ended, uh, Defense Department. What year is that? I want to say pretty close, we're approaching pretty close to 79, 1979, 1980 time frame when the uh, defense budget was being cut. Mm -hmm. I do recall President Carter was in office as president at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I'm saying that, the budget was cut there. There was a reduction in the defense budget. Mm -hmm. And the program which I had applied for to become a PA, those funds was cut. And one of my most beautiful experiences, though, I think, and what I can recall is when I was uh, up at Fort Bragg, had an opportunity to work pretty close at one time with some uh, Special Forces men. Uh, if I could relive and had an opportunity to, to cut my own path, I think that's where I would really find myself is being with uh, the Special Forces of the Special Forces and Medic. But, but, you know, things took a different turn for me. Uh, after the money was cut, and of course I had, at that time I was a young guy uh, searching, trying to find my way, and I got accepted into college. And after I got accepted into college, I stayed in the Army Reserves at the time. And then I was able to go into the ROTC program, mm -hmm. and I just took a different path, but I was still able to serve. And the military, I, I say they took care of me, and I was able to serve, and I, I did my job from that perspective. Although I, I veered away uh, very, very, um, I, I was a deep variation from medic to where I ended up going into ordnance and, and the logistics arena. And then I stayed in the ordinance logistics for an extended period of time, uh, probably just about 10 years or so. Okay. And then, um, your first duty base. My first duty base. After, after your training in basic. I went to Fort McCoy, and from Fort McCoy, I came into Macon, Georgia. I was on an Air Force base, actually. I okay. Did. So we need to hear about your first duty base. How long were you at your first duty base? Okay, Fort McCoy was a, was another training installation for me. So right. it was a short period of time I was there, um, about ninety days or so. I was at Fort McCoy. Oh, okay. I left Fort McCoy. I came into Macon, Georgia. Macon, Georgia. I was there with a with a with a reserve unit, 32, 32 the three fifty second maintenance battalion. What base? The closest base at that time between Fort Bennett and the Air Force Base where I stayed. Okay. It wasn't actually on a base, it was downtown, the base, the installation. Oh, okay. That's where it was. Mm -hmm. And we were co-located at that time with a Navy activity. That was an actual reserve unit, 352nd Maintenance Battalion. So you was a reserve unit. I was working in support of a reserve unit. I was full-time there at a reserve unit working. Okay. What did you say about the Navy? There was a Navy activity that was co-located with us in okay. the same building. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you worked with the Navy? I, well, I worked for the Army, and guess what? But the Navy was there. Obviously, we had created a relationship, a right. partnership, mainly because, too, they had, here we go again, they had medics, and they provided. When we went to the field, or when we needed support from them, we was able to tap in on some of the expertise that they had. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, up to this point, uh, how, was, how was the food? The food from the <laughs> beginning. Yeah. How was the food up to that I, point? I, I, well, did, the you, did you eat the, the military base or the military, military, the military mess hall? Yeah. Uh, when I was an enlisted guy, I ate in the mess hall. No yeah. question about it. Okay. Absolutely. I, I had no problems with the food. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I had no problems with the food. I, okay. uh, I, now, I will say this. At some point, you would like to have a break from the food. That's why you may go order a hamburger or order something that we call, you know, you go to what, you know, some place that, say, we consider a greasy spoon. Uh -huh. So you, you take a break from the mess hall. But I, I did not have any objection or any issue there. I was, uh, I, I just, I, I thought, I, I couldn't argue about the food. It was food. all good. I couldn't argue. You know, you couldn't argue about the food when I was home, being my father was a World War II vet. Right. I didn't have many sources. Right. You know, I, you, you would eat what's on the table. So again, going into the military, you know, the food was in front of you, 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 you eat what was there. So, uh, and I, uh, I don't think the food okay. was an issue for me. All right, um, next duty base. 
After, after Georgia? Was it after? Oh, I ended up going to Aberdeen Proving Grounds for Aberdeen Proving Ground was in Texas. A, no, Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. Maryland, Maryland. Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. Okay. That was a six, six months so training course for me as well. Okay. So I told you I stayed in school. Yeah, you got a lot of school. That's good. Back, but let me let me say this. Let's so, see. Early in my career, I was told that if I spend less than ten years in school, I fail myself. Really? I was told that if I spend less than ten years in school, I fail myself. Now that's it was put that way to me because at that time my mentor was explaining to me the importance of school and to take every school you can and you don't wait until the last minute to try to get it because you gotta realize in going to school you had to have these schools for career progressions and okay. career progressions were important okay so I was at Aberdeen left Aberdeen and I went to Birmingham Alabama I do recall there was the 121st I want to say uh, headquarters, of, it was an Army Reserve Command, ARCOM they called it at that time, mm -hmm. Army Reserve Command. So I, I served there for about 18 months, left from there and I went to Fort Leavenworth for my uh, officer uh, CASCU course, the Command Buying Arms, Command, command Buying Arms course. Mm -hmm. Um, what's the exact name of that course? I thought I got it written down somewhere here. Mm -hmm. But uh, went went to Fort Leavenworth. Stayed out of Fort Leavenworth for several months. I forget how long that school was. So I was out there for several months. Okay. Then I came. We went from there, and I went to Cascom or Fort Lee. Where's that? Virginia. Fort Lee, Virginia. How long were you there? I was at Fort Lee, Virginia for about three years. After serving Fort Lee, Virginia, I left from there. I'm trying to think, did I go to school from there? Fort Lee, Virginia, no. I went up from Fort Lee, Virginia. Then I went to St. Louis, Missouri to the record center, the Army Record Center. The Army Record Center is there where they get all, all the retired records and so forth. And out there, I served as a uh, career Development officer, career officer. Uh -huh. I was managing other folks' careers. Right, and I, and also. Um, How long were you there? I was there for right at thirty months, two and a half years. Okay, about two and a half years. Uh, while there, I did complete another school. I completed at that time the command general staff school. So I, I I'm, I'm painting a picture here to tell you that it, school was very important, very critical. I took the advice of people and that I did that course by correspondence. So upon completing and finishing there, I went back to Fort Lee, Virginia. And while at Fort Lee, Virginia, I, I got into this program called uh, LEDAC. I was accepted in the LEDAC program. The LEDAC program is the Logistic Executive Development course. And that's one of the most senior level logistic programs that the Army has. By the way, so, what rank were you when you retired? I retired as a lieutenant colonel. Oh, okay. Five. Mm -hmm. right. So, mm -hmm. from there, okay, I, at Fort Lee, I went to the um, LEDAC Logistic Executive Development course. Right. I stayed on Fort Lee at that time. I, uh, I, I just transitioned to uh, the 310 TEDCOM, which was there on Fort Lee, and I stayed there with them upon completing the LEDAC program. LEDAC course was six months long. So I was at Fort Lee at that time, I was there for two years, maybe three, I was there for about three years. I left from there, and I went to, I went to, actually I went to Atlanta to Fort McPherson. Okay. Okay. And there at Fort McPherson, I served with, I served with the uh, there's a the Army Atlanta Army Contracting Center. The Atlanta Army Contracting Center is when I was assigned to, and that's when I got into the contracting business. That was on Fort McPherson. Okay. And I was doing government contracts. Everybody good? Yeah. Okay. 
So I was doing government contracts, and that's where I started an, an intern. I was a captain at this time. I uh, had started the Army um, Acquisition um, Program. And let me back up for a minute. While I was at St. Louis, I was telling you I was working on my uh, commander of staff school. Right. I also was doing the grad program on the also That's why I got my graduate degree. I got my graduate degree there in uh, procurement and acquisition management. And getting the degree in procurement and acquisition management, then I went to Fort Lee. Upon completing me that, the Army, they looked in my records, and that's when they asked me would I be interested in doing Army contracting. Mm -hmm. And I said, of course. So then I had I had been then reassigned to Fort McPherson, to at that time was known as the Army um, uh, Atlanta Army Contracting Center. Uh, the director there was a guy by the name of Ron Howard. He was a civilian. Uh -huh. And I was the only green suitor working among about 40 civilians. And I and that's why I went, I got trained under them. On, in, in that environment, um, we was reorganized and then the Army was reorganized in the contract activity. So then we became um, part of the uh, I was part of that time. I became part of the uh, Army uh, Contract and Expeditionary Command, mm -hmm. and we had the Expeditionary Command, and then we had the Army Contract and Activity or Army Contracting Command. But I was part of the Expedition Command, and we, there was the two of us basically operating under the same umbrella. But it was the Expedition Command was the deployable one, and most of the guys there was assigned to uniform. It was in uniform. We had some civilians, but most of it was uniform. And then I stayed with that Army acquisition and contracting until I retired. So after leaving the Army contracting, uh, after leaving at Fort McPherson, just give me one second, sir. Sure. Fort McPherson. Okay. No, that's uh, okay. Okay. While at Fort McPherson, I also worked. With the Army Reserve Command, we stood up what we called, we was commonly referred to as case of the Contract Administrative uh, Support Command. The reason we did that, the general wanted control and full accountability of all the contracts in his, in his command. So we was, and me and uh, the lady I was working with, who was my boss at the time, mm -hmm. um, a lady by the name of Alice Rose, she's also in uniform. Um, we were both majors at the time. So we stood up the office, Contract Administrative Support Command for the Reserve Command. And then I ended up going from there, after we stood up that command, we are still on Fort McPherson. I went to work for Third Army on Fort McPherson. Okay. And you gotta realize Third Army- What state? Yeah, Fort, okay. Fort McPherson, Georgia. Okay. Okay. So I was there with Third Army um, after leaving the reserve command, went over to Third Army, stayed with Third Army, deployed with them about four different times, mm -hmm. and um, I forgot about the deployment in Panama. We we'll go back to that if you want. But um, we, we uh, I deployed with Third Army into uh, Kuwait in the uh, OIF and um, OEF operation, and uh, we did contracting there in the desert. And I'm saying in the desert. We was uh, ordering, you know, whatever the uh, mission required for the soldiers to do a continuing mission for our soldiers. One of the big things over there was, uh, oh, was uh, can't do that. that. No, no, no. Stop it, honey. Just hit the red button right here. Uh, yeah. yeah, we have to take a break. Can't see what that is. Pick up the red one. Mm -hmm. Got it? Mm -hmm. Now, did you want? to see the bonus album because sometimes he leans forward. Do you want to? <laughs> oh, here, press that one. Yeah, but no. With, with this camera? Yeah. I don't need to lean forward. It's okay. Well, I got, you, we got but relatively good depth of field. Oh, okay. So that throws everything off. Yeah. Got it. There you go. See the, the red? See the red? It's fine. So, what's the problem? I was just wondering if you wanted to. 
Hold your hand up. That's fine. Uh huh. Well. Okay, boss. I'm just, I'm just trying to keep. <laughs> no, I know you're, you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Panama. Panama. Okay. When I when I left when I finished my requirements, uh, college requirements, my studies at uh -huh. Southern Ohio State, I'd already been commissioned. Um, I did not march because we actually was going into Panama. Oh, the unit I was with at the time. Uh -huh. So we went into Panama and we worked in Panama for quite a few months. And we was in the jungles of Panama and we was building a tank trail actually, what we was building. And we, we was all across Panama, but in particular we was going to tank, building a tank trail between uh, Panama and the back of Honduras. If you recall, there was some activities going on between, uh, when I say activity, some um, political issues going on between uh, our country here, the U.S., and what was going on in Honduras at the time. So we was ahead of that invasion uh, a few months building the tank trail and doing some of the preparation and things of that nature, uh, the unit I was with. And from there, uh, after we completed that, Obviously, the invasion took place shortly after we left out of there, and we left out there. I think it was the latter part of '86. Okay. And the invasion took place probably either '86, '87 times. So '87 when the invasion took place, I think, if I remember correctly. Right. Yeah. So with that being said, that was part of, of my uh, service. Also, at that time, I was a uh, young lieutenant. Mm -hmm. I was working with a, uh, a maintenance company. I was an ordnance ordnance guy, ordnance officer at the time. And um, we was responsible for wheel and trike vehicles, meaning that uh, the, the tanks and also uh, a repair of the tank and repair of uh, wheel vehicles, the Humvees, Jeep, and all that we had back then at that time, okay. mainly Jeeps. Okay. So that was, that was the Panama experience, and that was around the 86, 1986 time. Frame. Okay. 85, 86. How many bases did you um, serve on? How many bases? A after, after, yeah, at the, because we, we've got to move forward. Okay. Okay, so how many bases have you served after the ones that you've already mentioned? You mentioned. Um, my, I retired off of Fort McPherson, Georgia. That was the last base I was on. So that's, that's, that, was, that was it for me. That was it? Yes, sir. Last how many base. years were you there? I was there for at least seven years, almost eight. Okay, and then you retired? I retired from What year was that? I uh, retired in 2007. I served three different commands while I was on that one base. There was three different activities I served there. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so I was. Did you ever have any problems staying in touch with your family throughout your entire 30 year career? None at all. Okay. Um, casualties. We, have you ever been in combat? I was in combat. I was in combat in the most recent war here, yes. I what war? Where? Where? I, I, I was in Kuwait, the combat zone in Kuwait. I deployed over there four times. Um, the, the deployment we did in Panama, that was prior to the actual invasion itself. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I was in combat there. We de I deployed in Kuwait four times. Okay. We was, I was over in uh, Iraq once. Uh, casualties. Either um, wounded or deceased. In the Middle East, what 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 was your experience with casualties? Um, I, as far as me personally, I, do you have a disability? I do have from the military. Yes, I do. Is it your knee? Part of it is the knee with twenty eight other issues. Twenty eight total, about twenty eight other concerns. Is that from from the, some of them, some of them combat more the combat related uh, issues, yes yes with the PTSD okay. um, right um, okay so that's one of them um, there's uh, some digestive internal issues going on that mm -hmm. you can't see right and um, but they're both knees left and right I got issues there okay um, 
So. And was that from an explosion? Uh, you were shot? No, 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 none of that. Not me. I, I did not receive any personal, uh, physical uh, uh, attacks or wounds or anything like that. Okay. Uh, we had ammunition, ammo dump, blew up in our area. Uh -huh. And of course, we, we also had the uh, tanks that was blown up that was evacuated in the rear. They was in our area. So smelling and breathing some of that, of course, you know, the, the burn pits, you, 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 you come in contact with that type right. of stuff. So that you know, those are the things that you know was really, that I know I personally experienced some of that. Okay. And uh, did you lose any? You know, I, I, I this always is always I hate this, but it's it's part of it. So right. Close friends. Did you lose any cro close friends in combat? I I I'm gonna say no. I know one of the guys I was from my high school young kid. I know his parents. He he I, I love it. He he they lost a son, which right. I, I know and I know the family very well. Um, uh, from my hometown and so forth. And I say we I went to school with his parents. I lost that, that young kid. He did not belong to me directly. Uh huh. But but I know and I knew. How do you handle your PTSD? Well, <laughs> I I. I you asked a question, I don't know if I could really answer per se, but I know, I know what I prefer at times. I prefer to be left alone, I prefer to be alone. Um, um, I avoid people, I know that. Uh, mm -hmm. People uh, are difficult to deal with. In fact, I just had a conversation with a lady yesterday about uh, an issue we was discussing. And it was about, uh, I think sometimes I'm still adjusting to uh, dealing with these people to a degree. But um, I also have to take my medication to help myself cope from day to day. So right. when you when you talk about uh, how you handle PTSD, I don't think there's a set way to handle it. You just right. To, you to each his own. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think too that um, by me going to counseling, which I have and I did, and that's, that's I think that uh, it allowed me to how to control it and how to control myself. Get a warning of where I where I need to either remove myself from it or not deal with certain situations. Okay, but also I think it's important that I share with you when you talk about uh, wounds in combat, uh -huh. where I don't have say the physical impact. Like I was telling you, I had a tremendous amount of experience with schools. Same way with my uh, experience in contracting, uh, made certain I got my certification learn as much about contracting as possible. So when I was tapped to go into the desert to do contracting, they tapped me for a purpose and that's because they had a lot of issues over there with contracts. And some of the issues was the uh, ill business practices which some folks was engaged in. And that was, I'm saying US military types and civilian and so forth. So I went over there and I tried to help clean up some of that. And I was heavily engaged in help cleaning that. So when I got there, there was like 2,500 contract claims, and a contract claim is where a, uh, a vendor feel that he's been fractured in some kind of way, so he's filing a claim against the government wanting compensation, but he didn't get properly paid, and some of these guys said, oh, when the war first got started, I pushed a million dollars worth of water over there, and I never got paid for it because it was in need of water, so I saw all of that. That was just 2,500 claims in it, and it probably pretty close to about a $30 million worth of claims. And on top of that, there was guys even on my staff, young officers, right? Mm -hmm. um, they got themselves tied up and involved in some activities and, and that was uh, not legit, and dealing with the locals and the people and some of those vendors. And uh, of course, we had CID and uh, the uh, special investigators coming in and all this stuff things of that nature. So we dealt with we dealt with quite a bit of that um, over there. I know I did. I did. And every day somebody was in my office and of course um, that actually followed me after I retired. For about the four months, another five years, not long after I retired. I was on a subpoena for five years by the uh, by the uh, Department of Justice. Okay. So uh, when you talk about the PTSD, you talk about the wounds, although you know, this probably come from running and day-to-day uh, -day physical activities with both knees damaged right. and all. 
but that that impact, and you have to uh, you have to experience the uh, you have to experience the uh, CID and the Department of Justice itself, and um, the special agents knocking on your door and things of that nature, and, and serving you and all of that. You have to experience that to have a better understanding of what it's about, and to realize the pressure it puts you under. It's not a matter of that. I was, I, I've never been found guilty and I, I never had a reason to commit anything of violation. Mm -hmm. But the idea that they question you in a fashion that that is done, um, it's not comfortable for me, one comfortable for my family, because mm -hmm. my wife there, someone knocking on the door and say, hey, I'm special agent so, and then I'm having to explain to my wife what happened and reassure her that, honey, I didn't do anything to put you in the family in any kind of jeopardy. I mean, but later on, as I was being um, interrogated, I'm saying, um, questioned, and also um, as the investigation continued, uh, Department of Justice, uh, the representative there, and all they advised me at that time that they would use me as a witness. Uh -huh. But in order for them to validate that the witness was speaking the truth, they had to carry me through a certain amount of questioning and scrutiny to make certain that my statement was valid. But um, that was an experience within itself. But we had uh, we had uh, some uniformed guys in a certain, I mean, some of them are probably still serving time today mm -hmm. uh, from, from that action, so. Gotcha. Um, have you, okay, I need for you to um, share all the, uh, besides the places that you've already mentioned, all the places um, that you went on R&R, &R, uh, um, you know, other, the other places that you have been stationed uh, while you were in service. So taking a break, you know, vacation, um, and um, I, um, yeah, one of my one of my secret acquired spots when I took a vacation when I took when I took when I took leave, uh -huh. um, I would go to Patrick Air Force Base. In Florida. In Florida. Uh -huh. The reason I went to Patrick Air Force Base, uh, before the storm came along and washed those TLF, the TL, the temporary uh, lodging facilities, okay. they used to have some right on the ocean there. Uh huh. And I uh, used to rent a three bedroom for not too much. And uh, the wife and the children and I would go there. And uh, that's where we would go for our getaway. I, uh, I, I as I did for a standard practice uh, during that time, I think uh, to get away from everything when I, I had to and I felt the need to. Right. Um, I would always, my mother-in-law knew all the time where we were, without question about it. My mother-in-law knew 100% of the time because my mother-in-law and my wife, obviously they would talk almost every day, but my mother-in-law knew. And the fact that I was, I, I entered the military here in Florida and I always would say my 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 destination was my mother-in-law's house. Okay. Which was in South Florida. All right. And but I always stopped about an hour and a half before I got there, and would go to Patrick Air Force Base. And my mother-in-law knew we was on Patrick Air Force Base. So if anybody really <coughs> needed us, my mother-in-law knew to send them to Patrick Air Force Base. Right. But that, and I and I would say that um, obviously we took a few cruises along the way, my wife and I, and children. To where? Um, and sir, to where we took cruises to throughout the Caribbean. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we we would have been to of course you know the bases, the yeah. Cozumel. We've been uh, we've been to uh, Nassau and so forth, and okay. also to several other islands here. But gotcha. throughout the Caribbean, we went to uh, actually we flew over to um, Antigua. We flew okay. we flew to Antigua out of Patrick Air Force Base. Nice. That's when they had the radar systems over there. Okay. So. Um, where oh of course we go to New York to the drama plays that was one of the things that we would do uh, oh okay. as a getaway uh -huh. we go to New York stay stay up there near the uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, theater district and uh, just in Manhattan that. yes sir in Manhattan right. correct mm -hmm. yes so we we would go there but um, I, I think that's about it with the vacation. But okay. the secret to all of my vacation was Patrick Air Force. I got you. I will tell you that. Okay. This is a couple more questions. Um, how did the um, how did the military 
affect your your worldview, your point of view. The military affect my worldview and point of view, I think, in a positive way, I okay. can say. Um, what I mean by positive, um, I see things, say globally, and also I had the chance to learn other people. For an example, we live in Panama. Right. Um, the locals invited us to their home, and we had dinner with them. Uh -huh. um, I never would have had the opportunity if the military would not have given me the chance to serve. Okay. So I could say the same thing when I was in the desert. I sat down with the, even the Iranians. I had tea with them. Some of them had shops. I went into some of the shops and they would invite you for tea. So I met people along the way. And I think by meeting these people and talking to some of the locals and other local Kuwaitis or either the, uh, uh, some of the uh, Iranians and different people from background, some, some say Arabs. Um, we, I, I began to, and better understood, and I heard the same thing, Panama heard the same thing when I was in Southwest Asia. The guy said, we want the same thing the Americans want. We want uh, good school for our children, we want good health care, want a safe place to live, and so we just want to live without war. Um, but you're asking me, how did it shape me? It helped me better understand that we all basic human with the same needs. Okay. All right. We got all, all humans got the same needs. And we have a desire for the same thing. That's basically a conflict for self and family and the people that we know and where we live. Okay. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank you for a fabulous interview. Thank you so much for sharing. And I also need to thank you for the service that you have performed for our country in the, in, in the capacity of, um, of a veteran. And um, also, I want to congratulate you on uh, um, rising, to the, rising to the occasion in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the role of a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. The country, I, I, at the moment right now, I'm going to speak for the country. The country will never be able to repay you for what you have given to protect the United States. It's not possible. Anybody, anyone that sees your story will never be able to thank you enough for your service. And I am personally grateful that I've had the opportunity to interview you for the Library of Congress. Thank you, sir. You're more than welcome. Thank you, sir. And I'm also very appreciative that, they, that we have students here, 16 and 22, that are witnesses to this to this event, and I appreciate that. I thank the young people as well. Thank you, young ladies. I thank you very much for taking the time, and I'm happy you were able to hear what I had to say. Right, I'm very happy. So. Okay, find those buttons, please, ladies.